really short intros this time. We have a short serving on groups um, uh, training for today. And then I have some updates um, with our genetic scholarship being at the top of that list. Um, and then I wanted to talk about some, hi Jen, thanks for joining us. Um, I wanted to talk about some ideas that came out of the Colorado Consumer Call this week um, and some brainstorming on that and have some time at the end for discussion. So we will get started and um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Christy Weiss, uh, I'm the um, Consumer Engagement Director for Mountain States and the Social Media Coordinator here at Mountain States. And um, the question I wanted to see if everybody would answer as we're introducing ourselves is, are you in the Genetic Ambassador Facebook group? I just want to kind of do a touch base and see if I've gotten everybody in there. If anybody's um, on the call that's missing from that, I want to make sure and, and focus on getting everybody uh, congregated in there. So let's see. Next on the list is um, Annette's on mute. So I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, but Annette is our project manager for Mountain States. Um, and then I'll go to, I've got um, Susan next. Susan, are you on mute? Oh, there you go. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Susan Owens. I have been involved with Mountain Sites for about three years. Um, I have a family that has a lot of weird genetic combination issues and um, in pursuing that. And so I, my, my big passion is uh, the undiagnosed and the very complicated. <laughs> And are you in the Facebook group? You are, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. And next I have Jamie. Do you have a sec, Jamie? You can unmute us. Yep. Yep. So I have two kiddos with a genetic diag rare genetic diagnosis. And um, I've been with Mountain States, I don't know, I guess like a year and a half now. Two? Two years, I think. Yeah, I guess so two years. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and I'm also a PT and neuromovement practitioner, so I work with a lot of kiddos with um, genetic disorders as well. And so say your, I've say been, your state also, call your Colorado, Susan's oh, Texas, just because that's yeah. a great way for people to connect with oh, yeah. too. Go ahead. So I'm Colorado. Colorado. And you're in the Facebook group, right? I've got you in there? Yes. Okay, perfect. And what's your name again, since you're just a number... Jamie Stefanski. Jamie. Jamie. Okay. Yeah, she's over here showing up on mine as 1724. <laughs> Do you see that? Yeah. All right. Daphne, I have you up next. Are you still on with us, Daphne? I am. And I have a grandson who has uh, vascular Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which is very rare. And I'm very interested in uh, people getting the right diagnosis when they need it and quality of life issues. I also am a professor and we develop patient educational materials for Texas Children's Hospital. And yes, I'm on the Facebook group. And you're Texas, right? Yep. Texas and on Facebook. Perfect. Okay, Michaela, are you still on there? There yes, you are. I am. Hello, everyone. My name is Michaela, and I am in Colorado. My daughter, Lily, has uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility type. She wasn't diagnosed until she turned six, and it affects her greatly. And so um, that was a lot of years to go undiagnosed. So I definitely um, second um, what was said just a little bit ago regarding uh, getting that diagnosis at a good time. And um, I am a board member for Colorado Rare, the 501c3 here in Colorado that represents um, a voice for all those with rare conditions here in Colorado. I also sit um, as a member on the Family Advisory Council at Children's Hospital Colorado. I've done both of those things for two years now. And I also founded an organization um, about two and a half years ago called Someone Like You that privately connects individuals with health conditions. And I don't know if I'm on that group on the Facebook. I think that I am, but now that I'm thinking about it, I don't remember. So I'll double check. I'm going to check because I don't think okay. you're on the table. Okay. I will make sure. Like I, I know we it. talked about it, Christy, but then I think maybe I did it click in yeah it. no worries I'm gonna make sure that you're on okay it. thank you okay. <laughs> next, I, next I have Jen Vana are you on there Jen there she is you're muted sweetie let me get yeah I don't know if I can unmute you oh I got it I'm, go ahead I'm Jennifer Vanna I live in Montana I'm mom to a daughter with Pitt Hopkins syndrome which is an 18th chromosome deletion Michaela she wasn't diagnosed till she was 12 <laughs> Um, I also am the new center coordinator for the Montana Health to or Family to Family Health Information Center, 
which I just started at the beginning of June. So it's a new um, position for me. Luckily, it dovetails very nicely with what we're doing with this um, genetics group. And then I am on the Facebook page. Perfect. And are you calling in? Is that your new office? Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Yay. Very cool. Okay. Tracy Keller, I have you up next. Can you unmute us, Tracy? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so can talk? you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Tracy Keller. I'm in Grand Junction, Colorado. I am the co-coordinator for the Colorado State team. Um, I am the opposite extreme. I have a seven-year-old who was failed the newborn screen, so they identified problems before we knew there were problems. Um, so very, very different experience that we bring. Um, I'm a nurse. My husband's a physician, so we kind of see both both sides of the uh, medical care coin. So, um, and I am on the Facebook group. Perfect. Thank you, Tracy and Debbie. <laughs> Debbie Bridge, I just saw that you joined. Hi, Debbie. Oh. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I can hear you now. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Debbie Bridge. I work for Health and Human Services, Texas Health and Human Services Commission, and um, I've joined the group. I actually manage, project manage a website built for children by parents, and it's for children that has special health care needs. Tell us what the name of that website is. Navigate Life Texas. Perfect. It has so much information on it. And it's not just for people in Texas. It's primarily for people in Texas, but there's lots of good stuff on there for people that aren't in Texas, too. Yes, there is. Yes. <laughs> We're doing some again? exciting things. I'm sorry? Will you say the name of it again? Navigate Life Texas. Is that dot .com or dot .org? Dot .org. Dot .org. Okay. Perfect. And Debbie, are you on the Facebook page, the Genetic Ambassador Facebook page? No, I need, okay. to, I need to get on there. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I just want to wrap back around with you because I know you probably have your work account and your personal account, and I probably have to connect you through your personal account. So just okay. I'll, I'll wrap back around with you, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, sounds good. And let's see, I've got Melissa Fox, I see just joined. Melissa, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're, there you go. Yes. You're off. You're I, I, I muted myself when I first got in here. It was a little noisy. Um, I am Melissa Fox. I work at Texas Parent to Parent. We help families who have a child or family member with a disability find the resources they need, whether it's connecting with other parents who have been through a situation like theirs and they just want to talk to somebody who understands or they need some guidance. Um, or just finding the resources in their area. Perfect. And you are in the Facebook group, correct? I am. Perfect. I am missing somebody. I have 11 people's names and numbers up here, and I only have 10 on my list. So who am I missing that hasn't introduced themselves? It's following me. This is Adrian Paradis. Oh, hey, Adrian. Thank you. Hello. Hi. So I am from Colorado. I am um, an ambassador for Mountain States. I'm also mom to a now 13-year-old boy with 15Q syndrome. And I'm also the regional representative for the Duke 15Q Alliance, which is an international organization that helps families um, navigate this process as well as uh, facilitate research um, on the scientific end. Perfect, thank you. And you, I remember you are on the Facebook page, right? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I think that's how you knew about that scholarship and applied, right, for AmChip. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's how I got yep, involved yep. with everything, yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for introducing themselves and telling where we're from. It looks like we have a majority Texas, Colorado call today with some representation from Montana with Jen. So <laughs> welcome, Texas and Colorado. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and do our serving on groups training. And um, this one, whoops, there we go. Can everybody see that? I'm gonna make it full screen. Can everybody see that? Give me a, somebody give me a yes. Yes. I can't, I can't see you anymore, <laughs> sorry. All right, this serving on groups training is section eight and it would normally be our last um, section. However, we did a little bit of, whoops, we did a little bit of reorganization um, because we have one more session left on data 
And my hope is that Susan, um, who's on the call, um, did this training with me in about, gosh, it's coming up on two years ago, I guess, Susan, or a year and a half ago. Um, I'm hoping that um, her schedule will allow for her to help me with that in July. So um, we will wrap up in July with the data section. I will let you guys know the data section is a little bit hefty, so we probably will have to dedicate our entire July call um, or the bulk of it to to that session but we will that will be our last session and then we will wrap up this um, training which is the serving on groups training so this section eight is specifically skills for serving on groups um, and for those of you who might be new um, I think Michaela I don't know if you've joined us uh, for any of these trainings or not this um, training came out of Wisconsin, and at the bottom of the screen there, you can see the, their little logo, the, the Wisconsin Facets Program. We started this training at our Genetic Summit last year, and we had guidebooks for everybody. So if there's anybody that's joining us on the call, Michaela or anyone else um, that wasn't at the Genetic Summit and would like a guidebook, we still have a couple left of those. And the way you can get one is just to email myself or Annette and we can um, mail one to you directly. And the guidebook's really great because it's like a condensed version of, uh, so it's kind of the highlights of all the training and it has different tabs for each different section that we've gone over. The other thing I wanna let you guys know is if you've missed any of these, we have been recording them and they've been archived on the Mountain States website. And I will show you where you can find that um, when we switch gears over to talk about Mountain State stuff. So um, this specific section is skills for serving on groups. Um, and it's, it's a fairly general session. And again, I said it's, it's a fairly short session, but it's things like how, um, what will help me prepare for a meeting? What will help me participate in a meeting? Um, how can I follow up after a meeting? How can I deal with conflict? This is one of the ones that I know I hate, I hate dealing with, but it's something that, that happens when we bring, bring groups of people together. Um, and then how, what skills can help you feel, facilitate a meeting? So the, the focus again of this whole serving on groups training is to have um, family members, individuals with genetic conditions, um, individuals affected by um, genetics to be able to be prepared and equipped to serve on decision-making groups. Um, so that can be everything from an advisory council, um, at the newborn screening department to something in your school district to something, um, you know, at a, na at a national level. So we're going to go through these kind of bullet points here and talk about some of them. Um, in preparing for a meeting, keeping a calendar is always helpful. And I feel like with today's um, world and technology, that, that seems that should get easier and easier. <laughs> but I still keep a, a paper calendar beside my computer and, and try to put everything on my phone. Um, but I am a sticky note queen, and so <laughs> um, I, if you guys could see my computer now, I have a, a sticky notes with dates on my computer as reminders as well. So everybody kind of finds their own system for, for this organization, but um, I know once I moved over to electronic and trying really hard to put everything in my phone with alarms, um, that has helped me tremendously. <laughs> so um, one other thing you can do uh, before a meeting is read the agenda and additional items that are attached um, with, with the meeting. Um, that can really help you kind of gather your thoughts and know what you might want to speak up about. Um, reviewing past minute meeting, meeting minutes. We've talked about this before because especially when you're new to a group and you're coming into a group that has some history, um, looking at those past meeting minutes can kind of give you a little bit of that um, you know, time capsule or time, time machine look. You can kind of go back in time at reviewing the minutes and kind of get an idea of different things the group has worked on in the past, maybe different comments people has, have made. Um, so that can be helpful. And then also um, having some time where you can organize your thoughts, especially if you, it's the kind of meeting where you um, might be called upon to speak or maybe where um, you know, you're, you're part of a panel where they're gonna ask, the, the part of the meeting um, will be to have all the members give their input. Um, so having a chance to kind of jot down some notes can be helpful. And as always, I think this is the, the golden rule in life, right, is to keep learning, is to never reach that point where, where, where we're done learning, um, especially in, in group settings. Um, so the next, next section here is uh, some, sk some skills for participating in the meeting. Christy, yep. can I just say that I think it's also really helpful to like go to the web page if there is one for that group, or even just Google them and kind of see what comes up. Sometimes you'll be able to see what they're working on. 
And I also have found it very valuable to ask someone ahead of time what they see my role as. So am I a family voice at that meeting? Am I a community member at that meeting? Am I a parent at that meeting? Like, which, 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 which sometimes when they invite you, they have an intent for how they want you, what voice they want you to bring. And so I find both of those things to be helpful and they reduce my anxiety when I'm going into a meeting. That is perfect. And you know what, we, we talked about that, um, I feel like it was two sessions ago, is the section that's the role of a family on, on a group and there is a great worksheet in the workbook in the in the WI facets um, spiral bound workbook that I just used this week with our Colorado team Colorado consumers as we were talking but it is like a it's a worksheet about questions about a group especially when you're new to a group it gives you just a kind of a checklist of questions to ask somebody about so you're prepared and so you're not walking in blind um, it's a great, I don't have it in front of me, but it's a great um, tool that you can use. And I agree with you 100% about knowing your role because many, many of us, we can just tell from the introductions, wear many hats. We are parents, we are advisory council members, we are, you know, Debbie's um, uh, employed by the state, you're employed by a, a, a federal grant. Like there, we wear so many hats that sometimes it's, it's hard to take those off and take those on. So knowing what role they want you to play on the group can help put that right hat on before you walk in the door. So thanks, Jen, that was, that was great. Appreciate it. Um, and then, so these are, these are um, some skills for participating in the meeting. Um, attending all of meetings is great, right? You, you get a star if you get 100% attendance, but, um, but if you're unable to attend, and this, uh, this is something to know before you join a group is, is kind of their attendance expectations. And, especially with us, um, with children with special health care needs or being an individual with special health care needs, we know that sometimes um, things come up out of our control. So um, making them aware of that before joining the group can be helpful as well. But especially if you can't enjoy, attend a meeting, let the leader know ahead of time, make sure to get those notes or meeting minutes afterwards so you can try to fill in the, the gaps of what you missed. Um, taking and keeping your own notes can be helpful. Um, usually formalized groups have some type of mechanism for, for keeping minutes and, and that's assigned to somebody, but having your own set of notes can be helpful, especially when there's any discrepancy or the minutes might not make sense to you. Um, learning the lingo, we're gonna talk about this uh, in a little bit about um, things like acronyms and alphabet soup, um, but that can be really helpful. And this is the part where I stress to families because I, I feel like I was caught in this trap um, in my early days of walking this journey um, is do not be afraid to stop someone and ask if you do not know what they are referring to, especially if they are using an acronym. Um, we, we oftentimes forget that others might not know um, what NIH means or what WES, whole exome sequencing means. And so it's okay to stop and, and you should never feel um, like you're putting anyone out by stopping and asking the lingo um, or clarification on the lingo. Um, trying new roles. What this is referring to is if the group um, switches off, you know, maybe somebody's a timekeeper, somebody's a note taker, um, you know, be flexible and, and, and um, volunteering for some of those roles. Um, being a mentor can be a great way to, um, after you've been in a group for a while, um, to uh, give you a new challenge, right, and, and kind of take under your wing somebody maybe new that's coming into the group and be that, be that translator for them um, and uh, help them navigate that. And of course, this kind of goes without saying, um, listen for understanding. We have to, have to not always be the ones speaking out in the group, but we also have to listen to others, other opinions. And then this is the follow-up, um, some skills and tips for following up after a meeting. Um, those notes can come in really handy um, to remind yourself. I know I've gotten in the habit of circling or starring things that I have to do after the meeting when I'm writing my notes so they pop off the page at me. Um, staying organized, using technology to your um, benefit. I mean, what I love, love, love about Zoom is the record feature because we can, um, there's a lot of people today that couldn't make the call. I got, I actually got four emails <laughs> when I sent out the 45 minute notice. I got four emails back of people who couldn't make the meeting today who thought they were going to be able to. Um, but I was able to tell them, hey, no worries. We've got it. It's going to be recorded. You can catch it later. So using technology to your benefit can, can really be helpful. Um, Review written guidance, that can be things like the bylaws, um, that can be those minutes and things like that, but, but, but different things that are in writing and um, have been formulated for the group. 
and um, you know, take a little time to reflect on what you learned. Um, connecting with a mentor can be great. Um, this, um, this specific training was um, presented by Family Voices. Um, and so this, this other uh, bullet point here about touching base with a family organization or um, a Family Voices or Family to Family Health Information Center or a parent to parent chapter in your state can be helpful if, if you um, have any questions. A lot of those, a lot of those um, organizations are involved in, in putting parent leaders in decision-making groups, and so they're always happy to help. Um, reviewing any data that might have been presented at the meeting, and of course, again, keep learning. We never, never want to stop, stop that part. Oh, and my favorite, my, not, my least favorite slide, <laughs> dealing with conflict. Um, I'm sure there's some of you out there that maybe share my, share my dislike of this, of this uh, term, um, but the reality of it is, is that once you get groups together, um, it's inevitable that some people are not going to see eye to eye. And I love this graphic that they have on here um, by Gandhi. Um, honest disagreement is often a good sign of progress and kind of changing our mindset that um, conflict is not always a negative thing and can be a good thing can maybe make that a little bit easier to um, walk through. Uh, for me, it's, it seems very uncomfortable a lot of the time. But here's some tips that, um, that the Serving on Groups training provided which was keep an open mind, use I statements. And what they mean by that is um, rather than you statements, rather than saying, well, you don't understand where I'm coming from, saying I, my perspective or I, the way I see things is. So you're, you're internalizing it and giving your perspective rather than um, using a more polite, um, my uh, cause some that one is easier said than done, <laughs> um, uh, but um, it, it is true. To going in and, and removing that personal connection um, with the topic, um, even though that's very hard to do when we are wearing our parent hat, um, realizing that maybe on some of these groups we're not there representing our child, we are there representing a group of people who have a group of children that have special health care needs, and so so not take, standing up for the whole group's um, opinion rather than our, our child's can remove us from that, from that taking that super pers personal um, offense to anything. Um, asking questions, always, always important, but I think sometimes hard for families to do in group situations. So um, I think that takes some work to get comfortable um, when, you're, when you know people better in the group and you, when you've been in the group after a little while, you might feel more comfortable asking questions. Um, staying focused on the topic. I think, was it Mel Melissa, were you and I talking about this just this week? Um, referring back to the agenda, sometimes, sometimes I feel that some conflicts in groups can arise when somebody takes over the stage. <laughs> Have you ever been in a group where somebody decides that they're going to talk the whole group and really um, throws off the agenda? And so um, things like saying, you know, let's put that on hold or let's let's put that in the parking lot um and or we have an other category on the agenda how about we talk about that 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 then and then focusing everybody back on the topic um i think can avoid some of those situations mm -hmm. um focus on solutions not the problem and if you feel like yourself becoming emotional um feeling that personal personal um attack um, taking a break and removing yourself from the room or saying I, you need to use the restroom or something like that can kind of give, it's kind of that, uh, you know, five, four, three, two, one countdown and, and take a deep breath that can help and then re regroup with the group or, you know, rejoin the group. And then always remembering the group's purpose um, can be helpful in, in avoiding that conflict as well. Um, for resolving conflict, um, there are some tips that they are providing um, here as far as um, paying attention to the interests of the individuals in the group um, and, and um, honoring those interests, right? Um, even, even everybody, everyone loves a compliment. Everyone loves um, to have the spotlight sometimes sh shown on them in a positive way. And so paying attention to what different group members' interests are and, and highlighting those can be helpful. Um, listening first and talking second. I think this is hard for some people. Um, I know um, sometimes we want to jump in and, and clarify, but sometimes just stopping and listening to the other person um, can, can give you that aha moment of where they're coming from. Um, good relationships are a priority, especially when you're doing group work. 
um, and trying to keep people and the problems separated and not uh, attacking or not not attaching the the person with the problem um, can can help with that resolution. Uh, looking for facts by using the the who, what, when, where, why uh, questions and focusing your your line of questioning on those can help versus the um, sometimes conflicts arise when we when we uh, uh, are, are not in a factual situation where we're more in a uh, hearsay or a, uh, a subjective um, type of discussion, and then exploring options together. Um, so this last slide is um, some common strategies for good facilitation. And facilitating a meeting, um, you know, the different meetings look, different groups run different ways. Sometimes, you know, you might have a chairperson facilitating a meeting and that person runs the whole meeting. Sometimes you might have um, different sections of the agenda run by different people. Um, sometimes you might be facilita facilitating the meeting or you might be um, uh, called on to facilitate a portion of the meeting. Um, and so see that these are just some strategies to, if you are in that position of a facilitator, of how you can be a good one. Um, making everyone feel comfortable, welcome, and valued is really important, um, especially when it's a new group coming together and no one knows each other. I know we experienced this with Mountain States when we went, came into this grant cycle and we formed the state teams. That was a brand new concept for Mountain States and no one had been in that structure before together on teams like that. And so making sure that, um, you know, it took a number of calls till everybody got to know who, who was there and who, was, who, was, who, who everyone was, but making everybody feel comfortable, welcome and valued can really go a long way. Um, encouraging participation, especially again, when a, a new group forms, sometimes people are very timid um, because they don't know anyone and they don't have any allies. They don't know, they don't have any friends. They, they you know, you're on a conference call and everybody's voice is foreign to you. So encourage, calling people, not calling people out, but calling on people to encourage them. Hey, Melissa, do you have any, any suggestions? Hey, Michaela, what, what, what do you think about this? Can, can help people feel comfortable. Um, preventing and managing conflict. Again, we talked about that already, but a good facilitator is aware of that, um, kind of maybe senses that and tries to manage that. Um, good facilitators also listen and observe again picking up any of those cues for the the conflicts or or encourage you know finding out or being aware of who might not be participating to help help that um a good facilitator also clarifies group discussions and i think this i've seen this happen a lot on our state teams in a really great way where some of our group leaders or facilitators will say now if i think i am understanding this correctly this is what I'm hearing and kind of restates, it's, called, you know, it's, 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 it's the skill of restating um, what has been said to just clarify that, that um, for others on the call. Um, a good facilitator also supports quality decisions and um, ensures outcome-based meetings. So outcome-based meetings, um, what, that, what that looks like is usually some type of data gathering. And that's why uh, the next section will be focused on data because that can be a huge piece of outcomes. How are you gonna measure what the group actually did? How are we gonna actually know if we accomplished what we set out to do? Usually there's some type of measurement involved in that. Um, both, both, sub, both um, what do I wanna say, data-driven measurement um, and also um, uh, measurement that can come from interviews or from surveys and things like that. Um, and then last but not least, a good, good facilitator recognizes and appreciates contribution. So that's where you get to play the uh, role of the cheerleader and uh, patting everyone on the back, giving high fives, um, and, and recognizing people's contributions. So this last slide is our resources slide. And what I want to do is shift gears real quickly here because one of these, um, hang on, give me a second. One of these, there we go, stop share, um, resources is a video called Forming, Storming, Norming, and Performing. And it's a real short video. It's only like two minutes long. So I'm going to share my screen. We, we did a trial run earlier, and that helped me out. And um, the vol I've got the volumes all up. So I'm going to play this video. It's real short, but it's really, it's really a great video on the different stages that teams and groups go through. So I'm going to play it and let me know if you can hear it. 
In a perfect world, new team members would work effortlessly together from day yes. one. They would get along, communicate well, and productively focus on the team's mission. Unfortunately, we live in the real world. And as we know, it takes time for teams to reach peak effectiveness. Psychologist Bruce Tuttman first identified four stages of team formation in the mid-60s. These are forming, storming, norming, and performing. They describe the process teams go through as people form bonds and learn to work together effectively. In the forming stage, most team members are positive and polite, but some of them might feel anxious. During this period, people make an effort to get to know each other. The next stage is storming. At this time, people push against boundaries. There's often conflict around personalities and different working styles, as people become frustrated with one another's differences in approach. Some people might even question the team's goals and avoid taking on tasks. Some teams never make it past the storming stage. The third stage is norming. This is when people start to resolve their differences, build on one another's strengths, and respect you as a leader. The last stage is performing. Your team members reach this stage when they're able to achieve the group's goal without friction. As a leader at this stage, you can delegate more work and spend time developing each person to be the best they can be. Most teams go through each of these stages. And there's a lot you can do as a leader to speed the process up and help your people get to the performing stage faster. To learn more about guiding your team through each stage, see the article that accompanies this video. All it takes is one idea on how to change the way you see the world. To change your world. Robin is one of the greatest personal growth authors of our generation. Sorry, give me a second. I'm trying to find it. Genius is less about genetics than it's. There we go. Did everybody hear that? Was everybody able to see that? Okay. What'd you think? Give me some feedback. I thought it was I thought it was a great video, but I would love to hear your feedback. Has anybody ever seen that before? Everybody's on mute. Hi, Krista. This is Debbie. I have seen it and I love it. Um it's a really great model to, um, to actually emic when you have a new group. It really is. Um, and it shows how important each one of those segments are in forming your group and actually being successful. Yeah, I love it. I, this is the first time I had seen it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I had seen this like when we first started forming our groups with Mountain States. But I don't think it's too late to share it with our, some of our teams because I think it's a great it's a great um, self-reflection point too, right? You can say, hey, where do we think we are as a group? <laughs> Which, you know, Christy, what I loved about it too is it reminded me of child development. So when you're going through the different stages and how important it is to go from stage to stage instead of just going, you know, from the beginning to the end and not skipping those little parts because they have value too. Yeah, like, that, like they always say, yeah, it's not good when the baby does, just skips crawling and goes to walking because that can affect their reading later on, right? Like it's important to go through all of them, even though it's probably painful for the, maybe the storming stage. <laughs> Great. Well, I will, I will set, put the link in um, uh, the Genetic Ambassador Facebook group um, and I can, um, let me see if I have it pasted here. Yeah, I think I just put it in the chat too. So if anybody wants to cut and paste that, um, you can grab it and um, uh, share that with others. I just like I just thought it was awesome. So anyway, I want to I want to just pause for a second before I switch gears into our mountain state stuff. Is does anyone um, just have any comments on other skills that you have found helpful on serving on groups um, that for that you'd like to share or just some or anything that came out of those slides that just kind of hit you like oh yeah I really resonate with that and that's that's something. That's something that is important. Be flexible and open-minded. Oh, good one. Good one, Daphne. Absolutely. Anyone else? Something that I liked to do when I was, when I, when I'm new on a group, something I like to do is to send a note to somebody after the group, you know, handwritten. It might be, I really appreciated the data you shared on such and such, or thank you for spending the time teaching me how this group works or something like that. So making a more personal connection outside the group with somebody in the group that impacted me in a positive way. That's really awesome. That, that, that goes with, you're, you're being the cheerleader before you even have to be the cheerleader. <laughs> that, that, that encouragement can really go a long way. Thank you. 
Anyone else? All righty, I'm going to switch gears then and I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint that I, um, let's see, whoops, I'm on the wrong thing here, share over to this PowerPoint um, for this is this is the part of the call where I um, give some updates and um, some information about um, mountain states and, and just some things that are going on in our genetic ambassador world. Um, so I always start with the mission and our funding statement because we are asked to share that um, from our funders and we want to give them honor for uh, the funding that they provide. So our work is supported by HRSA, um, Health Resources Service Administration, and it is part of a three-year grant and this slide um, says that we just started year three. So June 1st, 2019 started, um, marked the beginning of year three in our three-year cooperative agreement with, um, with HRSA. And so what that means for us is that year three will end on May 31st, 2020, and then that will be the completion of this cycle for the Mountain States Regional Genetics Network. Um, now what has happened in the past years, in the past um, grant cycle, we were on a five-year schedule, and right about halfway through year five, um, an RFP came out, which is a request for proposal, um, and that came out from HRSA saying, hey, we are looking for applications for our next cycle. And so at that point we, we applied and were awarded this, this three-year cooperative agreement. So we anticipate, hopefully that will happen, but we don't know until, until the RFP is actually issued. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give everybody a, a timestamp on where we were um, in our cycle, especially just um, at the beginning of this month, we just started year three. Everyone knows me, I'm Christy, but um, I have my contact information at the end. Um, here is the group that I was talking about um, when we did our um, introductions. This is a Genetic Ambassadors Facebook group. Um, it is called Genetic Ambassadors MSRGM. So if anybody wasn't sure if they were in it, you can search that in the bar there um, on Facebook and find out. Go ahead. Oh, did somebody have a question? No? Nope. Okay. We have, I think, 22 people in it right now. I just, it's a place that I use to communicate, especially things that come up very, very fast that people might not see an email for a day. Back, Alexa. Oh, somebody there? Sorry, we're getting, we're getting some feedback from somebody there. Somebody might want to put your phone on mute. Um, anyway, um, so this, this place, this is a place where I, like, for instance, we had a, um, a scholarship application come up for an AMCHIP conference, and I think the turnaround time was just a couple days for people to apply for the scholarship. And so what I did is I put it here first, I tagged all the people that were in the group so they get a Facebook notice um, to, to if anybody was interested. I also sent out an email, but it seemed like it seems like social media with notifications and push notifications on your phone and stuff, this seems to be a great way to get information to people if there's a, a very short time deadline. So I did the same thing with our genetic scholarship application last night because we extended the deadline till Monday, but I've been on vacation, so I haven't gotten the chance to push it out um, on Facebook to all the different groups out there. So I was hoping that our genetic ambassadors could help us with that. Um, and so that's, that's what I did last night. Um, most of you have been on these calls before. Our genetic ambassador program is open to any consumer, parent, family member, individual with genetic conditions or who are impacted by genetic conditions living in our region. And these are the states in our region. So if you know anyone that wants to get involved some way um, with mountain states, please, please let me know and we can um, have them join these calls and um, get them involved. Um, but one of the big, greatest ways to get um, uh, new consumers involved, I think, is our genetic summit and our um, scholarship application. Um, I know, let's see, who's on here? Um, Adrian, that's how you got involved with Mountain States, I think, right? You came as a scholarship winner last year. Um, and um, I know a couple of other genetic ambassadors have been um, connected with us in that way. So um, the summit itself is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's gonna be September 23rd through the 25th. And um, I have a slide here on the scholarship information. So the easiest way to find it, um, I just posted it on the Facebook page, on, on both Facebook pages, the group and our Mountain States Facebook page. But if you go to the Mountain States website, which is mountainstatesgenetics.org, under the news tab, there is an article about it with the link directly to the scholarship. 
So that deadline again is Monday. We have um, eight scholarships, one per state. But what happens on Monday is if someone from one of the states has not applied, so maybe we have no applications from um, Wyoming, then um, that scholarship can be awarded to a, a, a state perhaps that has two or three people that, that um, applied. So we, we would look at other states then. So um, just know we have eight at this, at this time, one per state. And um, if you know of anybody that would like to go, if you're going um, maybe as part of your state, um, pass, you know, pay it forward. Send, send this link to a family um, that, that from your state that might like to attend. The other thing I want to give kudos to David Stefanski. She posted it in 13 Facebook groups last night. Um, I know we're all in social media groups and things with other parents with special health care needs. So um, other with parents of children with special health care needs and genetic conditions. So if you guys could do me a favor and post it in a couple of your local groups, that would be great too. That's a great way to get the word out. Hey, Christy, um, can I ask you a quick question? This is Tracy. Go ahead. Hey, on the post that you put on the um, ambassador's page yeah. about the summit, does it list specifically the states that they need to come from so that I could just cut, like, can I just take that and post it on the one or do I need to add to it? Yeah, if you go to the one I posted in Genetics Ambassadors Group, go down to the first comment and I put the text verbatim that you could cut and paste onto a Perfect, Facebook. that's what I've, okay. You speak my language, thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, thanks, I'm putting myself back on mute. Okay, I have all the states in there too. Um, uh, yeah, I absolutely put all the states in there as well. So yeah, thank you guys for helping spread the word. And, and Tracy, I know you're on mute, but I also, I, I did get a chance yesterday to put it in the fatty acid oxidation group and the organic acidemia group and a couple PKU groups. So there were a couple big national groups that I'm part of that I did post it in, but um, if you have- if Oh, you have, okay, very have, good. I'm already, then you, you did my job, thanks. <laughs> well, I'm sure you have local groups, so if you have a Grand Junction, you know, special needs group, go Christy, ahead. I got nothing. Didn't I tell you I'm a terrible ambassador? <laughs> Stop, Tracy. Okay, <laughs> well, anyway, switching gears real quick here to, the, to our genetics pop-ups. I just wanted to give you guys an update that we have five, we've had five genetics pop-ups completed. I'm so, so thankful and appreciative of everybody that's done a pop-up. Um, they're all highlighted here. We had two in Texas, two in Colorado, and one in Phoenix. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to you all. Um, our management team is looking at year three and hopefully doing this again. So hopefully there will be another round of genetics pop-ups. And um, for those of you that don't know, a genetics pop-up is a, um, a very small grant, about $300 is what we had it at, um, to have a group of people in your local area to, share, to get together and, sh and then share with them genetic resources and genetics. And we actually send you those, those resources. If you go back to this page, we send you a gene in a box. <laughs> and it's a whole box of genetics resources, including Mountain States information, and then gift cards to give to those people who have come to the um, genetics pop-up as a thank you. Um, but the idea is to, cause, to create that ripple effect in our local communities, connecting with people that we know, being ambassadors in our local communities and sharing, the, sharing this information about genetics to people who are either need the information themselves as a family, family members or individuals that work with people that need this information. So um, somebody, one of the genetic ambassador programs or genetics pop-ups, some people had some early childhood intervention people come or some people had some support group leaders come that then went back and took that information to their, to their you know, 20 or 30 person support group. So that is the update on those. And um, I've got two more slides here and uh, these last ones require some participation and some feedback and some um, uh, some information or some some discussion from you all. So I want to say a big thank you to Tracy Keller and the Colorado State team and the cons Colorado consumers um, for um, their help with this genetic acronyms project. This came out of discussions from the Colorado State team that when, we are, when you have someone, who, a parent or an individual who's new to the genetics world, um, like, many world like many scientific and medical worlds, um, the alphabet soup can be 
um, very, very overwhelming for families. And we got this feedback also from um, our consumer scholarship winners that attended our summit last year. Many of them were very early on their journey with their child's diagnosis, or may, many of them, some of them that might not have had, gotten a diagnosis yet. And so listening to those talks that were very medically and science, scientifically based, those doctors use a lot of acronyms. So this is an attempt to um, start to have a resource on our website that could help people um, navigate through that, especially those specific to genetics. So when I sent out the reminder today for the call, I attached that PDF that Tracy had compiled and I would love, love, love your feedback. I'm not gonna take time today to actually get gather feedback live, but if you could reply to my email and send me things like, what is missing? Is there an acronym on there that you really struggled with when you were first on your journey that's not on there? Tell me what it is and, and give me a link to where I can get a definition or, or we can look that up. Um, and then um, if you can look at the, <laughs> look at the resource, resource with, with um, uh, new eyes and say, is this helpful? If you can put yourself back into those early days, <clears throat> is, would this be helpful? for a new family member, a new individual that's trying to navigate the genetics world. So if you guys could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. It's only a page and a half, so it should not take a whole lot of time to look through. And it's, it's things like AAP is the American Academy of Pediatrics, NIH is National Institutes of Health, WES is whole exome sequencing. It's things that come up over and over and over in the genetics world. But I'm sure there's some, some things missing that might be important to you, so please let me know. Go ahead. Hey, Christy, can I just... Can I just add that I just yeah. want to tell everybody that this is Tracy, and I do know that we have I have intentionally left off variant of unknown significance because we are working on we're we're getting a joint effort from the um, multiple members to get the best definition out there because it is the one that comes up the most in all of the genetic before diagnosis, during diagnosis, after diagnosis. So that one is being worked on. I just wanted everyone to know it was intentionally left off for that reason. Perfect. Thank you for that reminder, Tracy. And, and, and we, you and I had talked about linking back to our resource that Mountain States had come up with explaining variant of unknown significant in layman's terms for families. So we can even, we, we can do that in addition to the definition that you guys come up with. So thank you. And thank you so much for your work on that, Tracy. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Okay. So last but not least, um, a few, I had a call with a few, few of the Colorado consumers um, this week, um, and um, there was a great discussion about um, bringing people together, not just from, um, like, for instance, this, this calls very heavily Colorado and Texas. We have more, more consumers in our region than can fit on our state teams, and so the genetics ambassador um, calls were developed and the program was developed, so there was a place for, for consumers to get together and and make a difference and make an impact and get training and get and, and talk about advocacy and so the, a few of the colorado consumers suggested adding something to the genetic ambassador calls which are the call that we're on right now um, a time to share up, upcoming state regional and national events and possibly even keeping a master calendar of those events or newsletter or some other way to communicate monthly upcoming events and that would be both, again, those things that are happening in your state level, maybe something that's regional. For instance, the Colorado um, group just had Rare on the Road come to Colorado, and that was done by Global Genes, I believe. Um, and then there might be national events as well. So um, my question to you all um, would be, um, as, I was, I was, as I was taking their feedback and looking at the structure of our genetic ambassador calls, I'm wondering if we might need a little bit slightly longer call to accommodate this, um, or but maybe a, an hour and a half, just because like right now we're coming up on, we got 10 minutes left <laughs> for discussion, and I don't want to cut discussion short. So my question, my first question is, would everybody be open to that, and do you think this is a good idea? And then the second part of the question is, our serving on groups training, as I mentioned, is coming to an end next month. And so as that is ending, um, we, we, that first part of the call, we can replace with something. So we could either, either look at um, something like another training, leadership training, maybe having speakers, maybe highlighting genetic ambassadors from different, different um, states, a mix of all of these things. Um, 
So I just wanted to open this up for discussion and get a little bit of feedback from you all on what your thoughts would be about um, having a little bit more of a collaborative piece to our genetic ambassadors calls. And I'm going to stop talking now because I'm going to lose my voice. <laughs> so go ahead. I'm opening the floor to you guys to speak. What's your thoughts? I think the speakers, um, you know, just, just having general topics, I think that would be a great idea. Okay. Do you have any specific topics, Melissa, that, that just um, might might be on the top of your head that you think would, 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 be, would be good for our genetic ambassadors to talk about? Well, I know we've all gone, you know, seen webinars and things like that, that um, we'd share in different areas, you know, like on the Texas team, we would share. Um, but Ivy on the Texas team, she suggested a people first, identity first language. Yep. Although, we're probably all familiar with it here. I don't know. Well, may, maybe taking a different slant on that based on the discussion we had and how do you communicate that to those who aren't familiar with it? <laughs> right? 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 Okay. That's great. Great. Thank you. Any, any other suggestions on topics or, or speakers? Or if you think of any, you can email them to me too. Christy, this is Debbie. Um, I think it would be interesting because we do have um, ambassadors from other states. Um, what their legislations are doing. Okay. States. Great. I love that. Good one, Debbie. I like that. And Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> any, anyone else? I'm trying to think who's on the call that was on that, on that call. Tracy was on there. Michaela was on there discussing some of this. Um, Elaborate on what you guys were talking about, about some of the events, because I think that was a key piece of, um, of sharing, um, would be for the master calendar, the newsletter. Does anyone want to want to talk about that? Yeah, I was on that call on Tuesday, yeah. and I think that this sounds like a really great idea, particularly with us being able to share things that are coming up ahead within a few months. I mean, there are so many times when we're planning an event with Colorado Rare that we could see a great collaboration to come in. And, you know, there's always so many different things going on um, that maybe we would think of other organizations to contact, um, but then maybe that doesn't happen. So I think that if there was this specific collaboration going on, then we could really do a better job at keeping connected with all the upcoming events and really support each other. And, you know, because I think that we could say something and maybe not someone on the call Per se would be someone that would want to be involved at the, in the event, but maybe another group that they work with or vice versa. And I just think that we could really help each other out a lot better. I like that a lot. And I, and I had suggested, so, so we, are, we already do our newsletter for Mountain States, um, but I could go back to our um, management team and just see if we could carve out a little section of that, um, you know, for families around our region, maybe highlighting some of that um, monthly, because that, that um, newsletter also goes out to practitioners and um, geneticists and primary care physicians. And so the idea I mean being that, you know, there might be some individuals in their practice that these, these events might be um, applicable for as well. Um, and then using these calls maybe to have a calendar to populate that information, right? To have the discussions on, on here, like, okay, we're looking, maybe looking three months ahead, you know, maybe we're looking at a three month window, like, okay, what's going on in July, August, and September coming up? And does anybody know of any genetic events mm -hmm. that would, um, would interest um, both genetic ambassadors and other families in our region? So. So here, here's something we could do. We could either we could either keep the call at an hour and then just use the um, okay. use the use the first part of it to be a speaker or some type of training or some type of highlight, and the last part of it to be this. Oh, hang on, we're getting a little bit of feedback. Sorry. Um, and or we could extend the call a little bit just to give us a little bit more time to talk. So. I want to be very cognizant of everybody's time, um, so I don't know if an hour and a half is too long to dedicate once a month for that, or if we really need to an hour. So I'll give feedback on that as well. Anybody have any thoughts on that? 
I think as long as it's not more often than once a month, an hour and a half was reasonable. Okay. I agree. Michaela. Okay. Reasonable. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I've only been doing these once a month and I think it seems I, I haven't felt or gotten any feedback from anybody that they need to be any more frequent than that. Um, but, um, um, you, you guys let me know if that, if it seems to, seems to work, um, once a month then we can keep it at that and maybe look at an hour and a half, giving us a little bit more time for, for some options, um, some legislative highlights, a speaker maybe, and then some time to actually share what, what we're doing in the groups that you're serving in and, and the organizations that we're, that we're working with. I think that would be great. Does that sound good for everyone? Yes. Yes. Okay. I got a yes. Anybody else? Any, any, should I say any nays? <laughs> Anyone say no? All right. I hear no no's. So um, the last two things I have here is just our Mountain States um, uh, Genetics Facebook page. If you haven't liked that and I uh, appreciate it and the Twitter, our Twitter account as well. Um, and then I have my contact information. Whoops. My contact information there, hang on, I'm going to go back one. I just wanted to show you guys where I'm archiving all the genetic ambassador stuff on the website. So if you need it or you want to share it with a family member or um, uh, need to go back, um, it's, there is a four families tab on our website and there is a, in the drop down, there is a genetic ambassador um, link on the drop down. There's also on the drop down, um, we didn't talk about it today, but we've been working on this for a couple months now, and so we've built this. Um, there's a Your Genetics Questions Answered, which is our, our Facebook Lives that we've been doing. I've taken them, put those on Facebook, and they are now um, also on our website there in the drop down under For Families. So there's some questions there about genetics and autism. There's some questions there about clinical trials and genetics, but these are questions that um, we got through a survey that families asked us about genetics, and then we made videos um, answering them with some subject matter experts in our, in our region. So there is my contact information, and um, you can always find me at kweiss at mountainstategenetics.org for email or text or call my cell phone there, and we've got two minutes left. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask if there were any other questions um, or, or comments or, or anything um, that anybody wanted to share before we, before we jump off. If anyone has a group of um, people with genetic disorders and they are looking at developing educational materials, for those patient families, then uh, please get in touch with me because I'm trying to look for new projects. I think we're, we still got some going with Texas Children's Hospital. Well, but we'll be looking for some new ones come the new academic year too. So Great. this is Daphne, so just let me know, please. And, and Daphne, can you, ex can you just expound on that just a little bit? Do, when, do you mean like printed materials, like brochures and things like that for families? Or? What, yes. What the, um, we had, um, she's a vascular doc, but she also has a master's in genetics, and she has a master's in epidemiology. She's amazing, Dr. Shane Morris. Asked ask us to develop some materials that are just handouts, sort of, that she could hand her patients when certain events happened. Say they had a, a bowel rupture, or just to know what a genetic, a gen genetic mutation is, very basically sharing information. And there's a pneumothorax, there's a, um, well, of course, we're working with vascular EDS, so the, it's the more vascular things. But uh, what is a, an organ rupture, what is this? Anyway, so that when her parents, when she has parents of kids come in and she's trying to explain things, you know how they usually only hear the first few words that the doc is saying, I mean, everything else is blocked off, that they can go home and they can, they'll have something tangible that they can take home and read over. Plus, they all have resources of different of reliable sites that they could go to to find more information. So we even had, uh, we have a comic book now for kids age 10 to 13, if they're diagnosed with a vascular Ehlers-Danlos, they can get that comic book and it's wonderful. So we're in, we just, I think we've done 21 now, different types of handbooks, uh, handouts. Wow. So cool. yeah, and after they get through with, 
with our my class and they go to the Spanish department and uh, we have a bilingual health degree and so then they're translated into Spanish so awesome it, are those available anywhere um, other than Texas Children's or is that kind of like an internal thing with Texas Children's oh no they're 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 um, <laughs> we we did them so like they, they're actually used even in the UK Oh wow! And so they're they're really used about, just about all over the world. So would no. You, would, would you be willing, like in the genetic ambassadors groups, to start a thread and share some of the links just so people could see them? Sure. We 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 don't have them posted, but we've well, been thinking about okay. now. We've been thinking about posting them. So uh, give me give me time to sweet talk our dean into that. Okay, no worries. Well, finish up your grades first, and then and then yeah. maybe that's a later summer project. <laughs> yeah, really. All right, thanks, Daphne. But I'm guessing if anybody's on the call is interested, they could email you directly or contact contact me to get your email address, and then I can connect you, and then you can maybe share with them a PDF or something as an example, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right, everyone, it's 3.01. I'm going to sign off here. It was so great to see you all. I've got um, on my to-do list Michaela and Debbie for the Facebook group, so I will work on that. Um, and I appreciate you all. Have a great July 4th holiday. And look for an email from me about um, setting up our July call to talk about data. <laughs> all right. And Susan, hopefully you'll be able to join us to present that. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Chrissy. Bye-bye. Thanks.